Good morning, uh, I am Joe Ginder and I'm here with my friend Eric Marsh that I've known for 20 years. Good morning. Uh, Eric uh, represents, uh, directs the, the Long Beach Church Collective and he's here this morning to give us a gift, a major gift which we're really thankful for and he wanted to pray for uh, uh, our church and I thought that would be a great thing to put on video so that you guys could receive some of that blessing of hearing him pray for us. Now I know God doesn't need to see it on video. <laughs> but we thought it would be encouraging to you if uh, you got to see him pray for us. So I invited him to sh show up for our recording this morning, and he's here. So, Eric, I'd like that. Well, it's really, really good to be here. My family and I live in Long Beach. We've been here for a little more than 20 years. Joe's been a, Joe's been a really incredible friend and a mentor to me. Um, we come today, and I really do come on the behest of brothers and sisters from throughout Long Beach who have been generous. They see that there are some people during this crazy 2020 who have actually, uh, they have more than they need. And, and one of the things that, that just encourages me to no end is that like in the book of Acts, those who had, had, had more then than they needed, they, they gave generously to those who didn't and who needed. And the same is true today. And, 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 and we, have, we have sisters and brothers who in their, um, in their Christ uh, following, want to be generous to those who, who do not have as much. And so we put out an ask and we, we raised about a quarter of a million dollars and today we bring $7,000 check um, to hopefully encourage the great work that Friends Church has been doing, uh, not only this year in 2020, but, but for, for decades and decades. And so uh, on behalf of, of just um, people who love Jesus, we, we say thank you. We say thank you for the critical work that you're doing. And, we, and I just, I'm really, I'm really excited to just uh, have the good news to be able to bring the check and to pray for you. So would you join me in prayer? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of, of being able to meet even virtually. Lord, we, we love to be in person, but we're grateful for the medium to be able to have technology to do things like this. Lord, I thank you for the gift of, of Long Beach Friends Church. I thank you for the gift and, and, and the gift that, the common grace gift that this church has been to our city. Um, the way in which children and teens and adults have been discipled. Lord, as I, as I think about the reputation of this church, this church is a peacemaking church. This church is a disciple-making church. This church is a, a church of, of great generosity to our city. And so we thank you for the gift that is this church in our city, in Long Beach. And Lord, I ask that this money would be an encouragement, that the great work that you've called them to do, the sacrificial work that is not flashy, it's not on the news, but it is actually providing life in very tangible ways to this neighborhood and to the people of this neighborhood. Lord, I pray that they would be encouraged and they would continue the good work that you've called them to, and the selfless work that they've, called, that, that they've been called to. And, and I just thank you for also, and I, I want to finish, Lord, I, I thank you for the gift of friendship. I thank you for um, the, the, the fact that, that pastors like, uh, like Joe and I can be friends for a long period of time. That, 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 that feels like a, um, like an, almost an unnecessary gift that you've given to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that gift, Lord. I'm grateful for Joe and for his leadership in my life and his friendship. And, and I, I, I just want to say thank you. So um, thank you for giving us more than we need. And, and today, Jesus, we're grateful for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Eric. That's, yeah. It's really humbling. And we're really glad for the work you do to mm, knit you. together the church community in Long Beach. And thank you, thank you for the, th the blessing you've been to us as a church and mm. to the churches of Long Beach. Mm. Thank well, you very it's, much. It's, it's, a, it's just, it's really easy. <laughs> so God bless you all. We are on our Good Shepherd sermon series. This is number five. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, we worked through Psalm 23, 
to introduce the Good Shepherd design pattern from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and that Good Shepherd pattern is used hundreds of times in the Hebrew Bible. And we studied uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel in particular uh, in our, our second uh, sermon. Then in the third one, we saw how Jesus in Luke 15 described himself as the Good Shepherd. He, he, he claimed to be the Good Shepherd that Ezekiel and Jeremiah had prophesied when God said he would come and gather his people himself, or the sheep himself. And then last week, we studied Mark 6, in which Jesus doesn't so much talk about the Good Shepherd as, he, as, as, as Mark gives us these strong clues that he is the Good Shepherd, and then Jesus demonstrates that he's the Good Shepherd by doing what the Good Shepherd does. So that was last week. This week, we're gonna study the Good Shepherd in John chapter 10, where Jesus talks about the Good Shepherd laying down his life for his sheep. Now, the Good Shepherd design pattern, uh, I'll just mention it. We've been reading Psalm 23 each week so far, but I'm not gonna read it this week. I think you might even have it mostly memorized. And if not, feel free to pause and read Psalm 23 for yourself right now to remind yourself. But some of the elements in that pattern are the Good Shepherd, is God, right? The lost flock, the lost sheep are his people, and the good shepherd goes after the lost sheep, often endangering himself as he goes after them, which is gonna be important in this John chapter 10 uh, uh, use of the pattern. And then he brings them home, uh, often to some kind of a banquet. So the, it, it's a good shepherd design pattern that's not just talking about sheep, right? It, it's intended to be interpreted as God and his people. So uh, just before we, we start reading in John 10, uh, it's always good to know where we are in a gospel, what's happening that leads up to what we're gonna read. Well, what's just happened in John chapter nine is Jesus has healed the man who was born blind. And uh, the Pharisees are unhappy because he's done it on the Sabbath and they're, they're grilling the man who's born blind and, and, and you know, who do you think this guy is? And so on and so on. And the man born blind basically says, yeah, I don't know, all I know is before I couldn't see and now I can see. And they're so angry with him, they cast him out of the temple. And then he, he's, not, he, he's like thrown out, no longer allowed, okay? No longer a member. And, and Jesus meets up with him again and there's a discussion with the Pharisees and this whole topic of spiritual blindness comes up. And the Pharisees are complaining, so what, you think we're blind? And, and, and they have an interaction about that. And, and then Jesus starts in on this, this statement about the good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. So that's what's le leading up to what we're reading here. The whole discussion after the man born blind was healed uh, and could see. And the, the contrast is the Pharisees who, because of their spiritual blindness, cannot see that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. So, John chapter 10, I'm gonna read the first five verses to get started. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs by, in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Remember, they're spiritually blind. Well, to understand John 10 uh, and this talk about the good shepherd, I think it's important that we talk a little more about how shepherding works in this time, and uh, um, that'll help us as we get through the rest of what Jesus has to say. In this time in the history of, um, of the culture in that area, most families, typical family, would have two or three sheep. They would have two or three sheep and they would use it for, to, to get winter clothing. They were not for food. Um, they would take the wool from the two or three sheep and they would turn it into wool cloth, and that would be their warm clothing for the winter. They would also have a donkey for transportation, that was their minivan, and they would have a cow for protein. They would eat the cow. 
So that would be the typical collection of animals that a family would have. They would live, though, in a village. They didn't live in an isolated farmhouse or something, right? They lived in a village or a town, and the town would be organized with a street that usually was a dead end at one end and open at the other end. And the families who lived on that street would usually hire a shepherd or one of the family members of the right age on that street would be the shepherd for all of them. So in the, in the morning, um, that, that shepherd, whoever it was, would come and, and they would call for the sheep to come out and follow them. And the families would open their doors or wherever they had the sheep at night and the, short, the sheep would come out and they would, you know, trot down the little alleyway, which is what the houses were on. Their streets were like, the, the, the common width of a street was wide enough for a camel that was loaded with bags. So they're not wide enough for a car to drive down. We would call it an alley or even a sidewalk, you know, a, a walkway. And the, the sheep would come running down that, that, that narrow um, passage and meet up with a shepherd who would then take them out first thing in the morning and, and walk to where there was, there was uh, some grazing land. And normally that would be like 50 or 60 sheep from one street's worth of homes. Um, they would uh, only have rain in November, December, and sometimes early in, into January. And the rest of the year, it did not rain. So what would happen is um, in January, you'd be able to find grass very close to where you lived. So you'd take the sheep out, they'd find grass. You know, the other streets around your, your village would also send their sheep out with shepherds. And uh, the shepherds would help each other and they would find grass. And sometimes if the grass was rare, the shepherds would compete and there would be arguments. But they would find their grass, the sheep would eat, and then they would go back, right? And then every day they'd have to go a little farther. So by the time you get <laughs> to late summer, you're having to go a long way to find grass. And you, you can't take your sheep to where the, the land is rich enough to farm because people are farming that land. You have to take the sheep to where the, the land is not rich enough, not wet enough for crops, but wet enough to grow grass. And then the, 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 the later in the season you get, the longer you have to go to find it until end of the summer, it's too late by the time you get to the grass to bring the sheep home at night. So that's when they would use these enclosures that were out on the countryside. They might use a cave where they had, they had blocked up the entrance to the cave so that only one sheep could go through at a time and they could use their staff to block it so you couldn't jump over uh, the others. And then they could count as the sheep went in at night and find out if they had them all. Or they would make an enclosure out in the, in the uh, pasture land in an open spot somewhere with a wall around it, usually just of rocks. Um, the walls would be just high enough to keep the sheep from jumping out. They would cover the top of the walls with thorns and other, you know, sharp things to keep predators from jumping up on the wall and down into the sheep. And then the shepherd would sleep across the entrance to the, to the pen. That, that's where the, the shepherd is acting as the door, which you'll hear Jesus talking about right, in this, in the statement he makes. Uh, and, and the shepherds would name some of the sheep. It, was, it, it wasn't common for a shepherd to have 50 or 60 sheep and name them all, but the shepherds would have certain sheep that stood out to them, and they would call them like floppy ears, or, you know, long tail, or, uh, you know, stubborn sheep, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever they want to call the sheep. Right? And certain of the sheep would be almost like pets to the shepherd, and others would not really be named. But there would be some of them that would commonly have a name, and the shepherd could call them, and they would often be sheep that the shepherd had identified were the ones that he, had to, he, could, he could use to keep the rest of the herd in order. Like, if you get that sheep to go, the others are going to follow, or whatever, right? And uh, they, they, would, they would walk far enough in front of the sheep, and they'd keep walking, until they got to where there was grass, and then they would slow down and, and allow the, sh the sheep to eat. They would even break low-hanging branches off of trees and give the sheep a, a treat from the leaves if they weren't fruit trees. Uh, they didn't break branches off of fruit trees usually. People would get upset if you did that. And the sheep don't follow a stranger, right? They know the, the, 
the shepherd who's, who's leading them. So that's kind of the context. That's what's going on in, this, in these villages and what people understand about shepherds. And so then we come to uh, verse 7 of chapter 10. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. See, he's referring to how the, the shepherd would lay across the entrance to the pen when they were out away from, from their, uh, their home. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. So they didn't always find pasture, right? Sometimes they'd go the whole day and not find any place to eat. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. It does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Well, Jesus is saying this intending a meaning in the, in the environment of the, the people he's talking to, right? These Pharisees that are complaining about him healing the man born blind, right? So who are the bad shepherds? Well, I think it's pretty clear that he's saying the leaders of the Pharisees, these ones that are complaining, these teachers of the law that are complaining about him healing this man born blind on the Sabbath, the ones who are not recognizing that he's the good shepherd, they, they are the bad shepherds. They're the ones who will run away when there's danger. In, in the Gospel of John, when John talks about being saved, he, he, he uses that phrase being saved interchangeably with having life. He's talking about the, the relationship that we have with, with Jesus, with God through Jesus, right? He's talking about being saved from the death that comes by being separated from God. And, and he, he describes that as being saved, and he describes it as having life. And he, he uses in this uh, scripture, or this, this statement he makes, uh, the, the example of a wolf, right? A wolf attacks and the good shepherd defends the sheep. Now, now Jesus sees clearly who he is, right? It's, it's kind of the most important question that anyone has to answer in their life, right? Who am I and what do I do? Well, Jesus knows. He's the good shepherd. And what does he do? He lays down his life for the sheep. That is his life, right? His life has a purpose. He has an identity. He's the good shepherd. He has God come, he has God come in human form to gather his people, his scattered people to himself. Jesus is the good shepherd and he lays down his life. That's what he's communicating there. He's communicating it clearly to anyone who has ears to hear, eyes to see. And the, the, the contrast is the Pharisees who are spiritually blind. He goes on, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Now there's some pretty deep theological truth being communicated in that statement there. And we'll get into that in a minute. But, but Jesus is identifying himself as the good shepherd again, right? I am the good shepherd. He's talking about what he does. He lays down his life. Well, we have kind of read ahead in this story. We know what's coming, right? We know he really does lay down his life. He talks here about knowing, right? He says, my father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. All right, and then a little later, he talks about how his sheep know his voice, right? They don't follow someone else. There's this knowing idea. Now, knowing is more than just information. 
in, in this, this language and culture. It, in fact, the, the way that people would describe uh, consummating their marriage is the, the man would know his wife or the wife would know her husband. And there's, there's this idea of, of deep relationship in which you get to know another person in whatever is the appropriate manner for that relationship. And the relationship between the father and the son, God the father and God the son, is given as like the, the model for what's available between Jesus and the church, his sheep, right? The, the, the father knows the son. The father loves the son because the son lays down his life for the sheep. And then Jesus talks about knowing the sheep and the sheep knowing him. That's the potential. Now, when he talks about laying down his life, he's talking about the cross, right? That, that's, that's just clearly obvious from John writing this, this gospel. He's talking about the cross. The way, the way it works in any relationship is when someone offers love to another person, accepting that love brings the two people closer together, the two, the two in the relationship closer together. Now, what happens when you refuse the love? Well, that means distance, separation. Think about that, that uh, uh, parable that we studied last week where one of the stories was the story of the lost son. We often call him the prodigal son. So he comes home, right? And the father runs to him before he's even home. Now, it's interesting. People from a, a culture that's closer to the culture of that time, they will say the reason the father ran to the son was to protect him from the hostility of the village, right? When that guy comes home, he's going to have such a bad rep, right? People are going to regard what he has done as so bad that they're, they're going to treat him badly. And the father runs to him to protect him from that and then welcomes him home. But the son could refuse. And if the son refused, then their knowledge of one another, their knowing one another, that relationship grows more distant. He, the son would not receive then the life that the father is offering him. And, and that is exactly the, the choice that Jesus is putting in front of these Pharisees. They are refusing to see who he is. They are criticizing him for healing the man born blind. And Jesus is, is, is making known to them, look, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. If you refuse the offer of relationship with me, then that's what you've refused. Something more than just a close relationship is offered though, right? It's not less than a close relationship, but it's more than a close relationship, right? Here's the thing. He's talking about life versus death. Refusing this relationship with God is not just, well, I'm gonna have a different friend than God. It's choosing death. It's a way that leads to death. Choosing Jesus, choosing God through Jesus, right? Because he is the only door. Well, that's life. And there's, there's knowledge of God that comes through that relationship. There's growing uh, closeness. There's growing understanding of who God is and what he's like. There's a change in us as we spend time with him. All of that comes with it. That's life. That's, that's being saved. That's what he's talking about. Now, in the, the story that Jesus tells here, the shepherd lays down his life, meaning he fights the wolf and he dies. But the sheep are saved. Now, he doesn't describe that, just like the cross is not really described in great gory detail. The point of the gospel writers is that we get the meaning. And the meaning is that Jesus has traded his life for the sheep. Now, I don't know if we're supposed to think, well, the wolf doesn't go after the sheep because it's got the shepherd. 
or what. I don't know if we're supposed to get into to taking the story that far, but that's what happens here, right? Jesus says the good shepherd fights the wolf and he lays down his life and the sheep are saved. Maybe we shouldn't carry the analogy too far, the story too far, but who are the hirelings in the story, right? Jesus talks about shepherds that are bad shepherd because they're hired, they don't own the sheep. Who are they? You could say they're the high priests, the, the leaders in Jerusalem, uh, the people who are leading people away from the good shepherd. Who's the wolf? Some people say the wolf is Rome because Rome is who put Jesus to death. I think that's maybe true superficially, but I think from a wider biblical perspective, and this is my opinion, the wolf is, is the evil one. The wolf is Satan. Uh, the wolf is the liar whose, whose goal is death for those God would make his own children. And the cross and the resurrection, they start a, a, a whole new thing, a whole witness to this good shepherd who not only lays down his life, but he takes it up again, right? And, and, and that's the reason, right? Jesus says it is for this reason that he came into the world, to lay down his life and take it up again, to win that victory over death. Now he mentions here something that I think is really important for us to just take a little time out and look at. He says he has other sheep that are not of this pen and they will know his voice too, right? There is evangelism yet to come. There are people to come. And in fact, that is the reason that God has called a certain people, the children of Abraham out of the world so that they can be a blessing to all peoples, right? And God is the one who is the good shepherd whose voice they will listen to. He will call them. And he may use the church to gather them. He may, he may speak through the church in a, in a human way while his spirit is speaking beyond the human way. And those sheep will listen to his voice. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 8 says it like this. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Right? There's, 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 old, there's Hebrew Bible prophecy. And then in Acts, there's the story of Peter and Cornelius. Now, you might remember, Peter at the end of the Gospel of John is restored as a shepherd, right? Feed my sheep. Well, Peter gets invited to go visit the home of a Roman centurion, a Gentile. And he goes. There's a sequence of events. You can read about it in Acts chapter 10. There's a vision, there's, there's all kinds of things that make it clear, right, where Peter, a sheep and a shepherd, right, hears the voice of the good shepherd and, obe and obeys it. He goes to Cornelius' house, Acts chapter 10, verse 28, Peter says to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God ha has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Because Cornelius had asked him to come. Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He's a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. See there, Luke is showing us the fulfillment of what Jesus is saying that John reports, right? I have sheep that are not from this pen. They'll hear my voice too, and they will, they will be called. So back, back to John. Uh, let me read verses 17 and 18 again of John 10. The reason my father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. 
I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. See, no one takes his life from him. Jesus is in charge. No one can take his life otherwise. If Jesus doesn't, in his own intellect, in his own will, agree to die, he's not going to die. Think of the people he healed. Think of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Jesus has the power not to die, not to allow anyone to kill him. He laid his life down of his own accord. He allowed those people to crucify him. There's no room to blame the Jews, like in an anti-Semitic sort of way. And it's interesting that, that one of the arguments that Muslims will make against Jesus is, is they, they respect Jesus, they respect his teaching, but they say that Christians tell us that Jesus was defeated and overcome by his enemies and killed. But that's not what happened. Jesus surrendered himself to the worst that his enemies could do to him, the worst that humans or Satan could do to him, and he won the victory over sin and death, the greatest victory that is possible. He, not only over, he, he is not overcome, he is not defeated, there is no failure, he is obedient, he lays down his life and he takes it up again. And it's important for us to present it that way. Right? That's how Jesus presented it. So, the summary of Jesus' victory is the cross is an expression of the love of God, right? It, it shows the servanthood of Jesus, but his servanthood is voluntary, right? It, he's not a servant in the sense that we get to command him. He, 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 he makes his own decisions. He's not under anyone else's control, and he had to allow his own death, and he takes his life up again. The victory is won. The price is not paid in vain. Sin and death are defeated. So if you want to summarize the theology of the cross, right, what Jesus is teaching here in this, this, this statement of the, being the good shepherd and laying down his life for the sheep, right, it's that evil is engaged, right? He fights the wolf. Evil is engaged. Suffering is endured, right? He, he, he goes into death, right? Costly love is demonstrated, right? He is willing to lay down his life and he wins the victory, right? He takes his life up again. That's the, that's the, the in summary, the, the Christian idea of the cross. That's what Jesus is teaching here. So let's think about this today. Well, we follow, we follow our good shepherd, right? Uh, Peter even went to a cross. Other disciples uh, went to martyrdom. Uh, What is your cross? Is your cross getting through COVID-19? <laughs> is your cross something else? I don't know. But I, I know this, sin and death are already defeated. The worst that Satan or this world can do to us is try to take our life. And the same Jesus who took up his own life has the power to raise us. Sin and death are already defeated. Were we in troubles? Well, we have a good shepherd, and he knows the troubles. He knows what it's like to be in trouble and to get through it. He doesn't often just whisk us out of the troubles. He goes through the troubles with us and then defeats them in the end. If not before, in the resurrection. We can trust him we can start to know him by accepting his love, by putting our trust in him, and we will learn. Knowing implies learning. I'm still learning about, about this Jesus, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And I'd encourage you to be a learner, someone who knows Jesus, but is also still deepening in your, your relationship with him, coming to know him more deeply and trust him more completely and experiencing the victory of, of his life over death. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we have uh, in this year, uh, 2020, a year that a lot of people would like to forget. We'd just like to cross it off the calendar. I don't know if that's what it's been like for everyone, but it's been like that for a lot of people. And Lord, I pray that you would get us looking at you, 
that we would see that you are um, a Lord who has passed through trouble, has passed through death and defeated it. You chose to go through those things for our sake, demonstrating your love for us. Lord, I pray that we would come to know you well, know you deeply, and, and begin to reflect uh, your light in our lives. Uh, Lord, we know that we are imperfect at that, and we ask your forgiveness for the places we fall short, and we trust in your love for us, even where we have failed, even where we have fallen short, even where we are like the prodigal son who's taken from you and then blown it. You come running to us, and you welcome us home. You protect us from those who would accuse us, persecute us. You set a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And our cup overflows, and I pray that we would know you in that way and have life in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you.